to everybody. I'm wishing you a very good, happy um, a new year. And may this new year bring you lots of joy, happiness, good health, and also uh, spiritual progress and development. <laughs> so uh, I was asked to give a talk um, for Chap Gome, and uh, we're going to have a, a lion dance after this. So this is not going to be such a long talk. Yeah. And the topic is developing love and friendship. How do we go about developing love and friendship? Is this something that we can do? Uh, we certainly want both these qualities, love and friendship. But uh, let me just uh, share the screen. Uh, share the screen. Hold on. Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, you can see the slides. You know, it is important that all of us are on a spiritual path, and a spiritual path is not a lonely path. So although it may seem so when we meditate, we meditate alone, but the spiritual path is something that we must do together. And there is plenty of benefit that we can derive from spiritual friendship. Now, once Ananda asked the Buddha about friendship, whether, uh, you know, because within the Sangha that was built around the Buddha during his time, there are a lot of noble uh, practitioners. And Ananda, who was the attendant of the Buddha for, for about 25 years, he was very inspired by this great uh, Arya Sangha. Like you have the likes of um, Venerable Moggallana, Sariputta, Anaruddha, you know, all the great, great teachers. So he asked the Buddha whether having good friends is half the spiritual path. Whether half the spiritual path is contributed by having good spiritual friends. And the Buddha corrected Venerable Ananda. The uh, Buddha says, no, Ananda. Having good friends isn't half the spiritual life. Having good friends is the whole of the holy life. So down here, you could see how important having good spiritual friends are. Because they are the ones who actually, it, they comprise the whole of spiritual life. We get inspired. And as we move along the path, within this company of practitioners. So that is the meaning of it. Then there is what we call the Megiya Sutta. And this is, sutra is quite interesting because uh, Megiyo happened to be one of the Buddha's attendants. The Buddha had many attendants before finally uh, Venerable Ananda came along as the uh, final and maybe the finest uh, attendant. Megiyo was, was uh, uh, the um, Buddha's attendant. And while accompanying the Buddha for a morning dana, he spotted a beautiful grove, you know, with mango trees and all, very quiet, very peaceful. And he thought, wow, what a wonderful place for me to do meditation. So after he came back with the Buddha, uh, with the Buddha and uh, had uh, the meal, he asked the Buddha permission uh, to go and meditate in the mango grove. And the Buddha says, hold on, Magia, because there are only two of us. Just hold on until somebody else comes along before you go. But Megiya is so excited about his newfound place that he kept asking the Buddha, you know, again and again. So after the third time, the Buddha gave him permission. He said, okay, Megiya, if you want to practice, just, just please go ahead. So Megiya thought it was a beautiful grove and he thought his meditation will, will be wonderful. You know, like most of us, we get inspired by a beautiful retreat. Something we thought, wow, this is the place you want to do a retreat. But when he said, I meditate, what happened? His meditation was anything but peaceful and beautiful. You know, his practice was too centered on thoughts of like sensuality, thoughts of ill will, thoughts of doing harm. These are the kind of things that we call this hindrances right, in meditation, the five hindrances. So Magia was actually quite frustrated. After coming back from the meditation, he, had, he, he met up with the Buddha and reported to the Buddha. And the master was not surprised. <laughs> These are the things that will, uh, you know, affect me meditators, especially if you're not really experienced and not so skillful yet. 
and he gave a good and relevant teaching to Magia. He says, Magia, uh, there are five things that can give rise to the freeing of the heart. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was giving a talk without turning the slides. Huh? <laughs> okay, hold on, hold on. Huh? Okay. All right. Yeah, Kalyanamitra. The first part is Kalyanamitra, then later on I move on to something. Ah, yeah, you see the uh, Megaya Sutta. Uh, the fact is to free the heart and achieve peace. And the Buddha uh, said uh, that uh, in order for us to free the heart and achieve lasting peace, First, it's a lovely companionship with good friends. Ah, that's the first quality that the Buddha said. Of the five things, friends, good friends, is the first on the list, right? Second is what we call virtu virtuous conduct. A third is frequent conversation that inspires and encourages practice. Okay, certainly when you have a conversation, it must be among friends, right? You don't have conversation with yourself. <laughs> That's called a monologue. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, this, uh, so the second, third factor also has to do with good spiritual friends. Fourth is uh, having diligence, energy, and enthusiasm uh, for the good. And fifth is insight into impermanence. So fifth is about wisdom. Uh, number one and number three has to do something with friends, spiritual friends. So the Buddha then elaborated the Magiya. He says that actually having close companionship between spiritual friends. When you have that, uh, then virtuous conduct will naturally follow because you get inspired by your spiritual friends. And so therefore you look after your virtue. So virtue comes after that. And then uh, when you have with the spiritual friends, you begin to talk about the Dhamma, especially somebody who is more experienced in the Dhamma and you have this uh, conversation with them and it gives you a lot of enthusiasm and energy to practice the energy to abundant unwholesome qualities and for you also to make aspiration to continue striving onwards to develop wholesome qualities and then this association with, uh, 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 will give rise to the realization of the dharma so in another words spiritual, uh, spiritual uh, uh, developed friends, then all the good qualities will flow from that, from good companionship, virtuous conduct, having good conversation that inspires practice, becoming more diligent in the practice, and then getting an insight into impermanence. Now, you will uh, be able to appreciate the truth and beauty of this teaching when you continue your practice over the years. Brother Bobby talks about how long ago I started giving Dhamma talk? Actually, I started giving Dhamma talks at, at the University of Malaya just after uh, graduation. So that was that was in the uh, in the twenties when I was in the twenties. And so now you know how, how uh, what how, what is my age now. So to have practice of good friends, maybe for ten years, five years, ten years. No way to go, uh, Bobby. I can hear you. <laughs> 20 years, 30 years, or maybe 40 years, it's a joy, right? So when you have uh, a practice with good friends, it is, uh, it is a joy. Now, as you ripen and you advance in age, you begin to appreciate the uniqueness of each friend and the gift that each has given to you, yeah? And when you have a long companionship with good people along the spiritual path, it is almost impossible not to cultivate spiritual qualities yourself that could eventually lead to your own awakening, right? So friendship ripens and deepens our capacity for compassion. So along the Buddhist path, spiritual friendship uh, takes a context within, uh, practicing within a community, a fellowship. That is why the Buddha established the ordained Sangha, right? in order that people could come together and practice together and support each other uh, for the practice. And within the Sangha itself, you have the teaching, you have med the meditation practice that we do together, and also the commitment to go beyond your self-interest and personal needs. So spiritual friendship is not so much of having this friendly connection with friends. It is more than that. It is a concern and also 
uh, the effort to help one another to grow in faith and goodness so that we begin to realize our own true nature. So that is what spiritual uh, friendship is about, giving the support. Now, sometimes, uh, very often, our teacher could become our spiritual friend. Of course, sometimes when you begin to talk about a Dharma teacher, or maybe you have a, a teacher that you respect very much, at first we tend to get intimidated by, by the teacher, right? But as time goes on, uh, this teacher could be a source of inspiration and a trusted friend. So within the spiritual community, we develop inspiring friendship, uh, uh, all right? And, uh, uh, and then we support each other in our practice. So no, no matter what their background is, everyone uh, who practices um, sincerely and cultivate is part of the spiritual community. And we treat them with full respect, like the way they treat us. So within the Sangha itself, it is a place for uh, the preservation of harmony. And you see, uh, the Buddha set the rule among the members of the Sangha, regardless of how rich, if maybe you come from a rich family, you have family become very influential, regardless of your background, the moment when you join the Sangha, you just go by seniority. If you are the, the last to be ordained, you're actually the most junior, regardless of whether you can't maybe from a royal family or whatever it is, it, there is this pecking order, regardless of even your practice, uh, you might actually be very well practiced and very knowledgeable and all that. But if you are ordained last, uh, you, are, you are the most junior. Okay, so this is how within the Sangha itself, they establish um, this harmony within the Sangha. And that is one of the rules uh, amongst uh, the, um, that was established amongst the monks. Now, let us go on. That this part is about spiritual friendship. Let me now move on uh, to friendship, to friends, friends as we, as lay people, as the way we know it, okay? So uh, let me just move on to the next slide. Uh, the Buddha's advice on friendship is actually found in the Sigalo Vada Sutta, uh, where the Buddha actually spoke about good, uh, uh, about good and bad friends, who are the good and bad friends. Now, the Sigala uh, Sutta has sometimes been called the lay person's code of conduct. It comes from the Diga Nikaya 31. That's the longest cause. Huh? Um, so this discourse has been given to young uh, Sigala, who prayed in six different directions, the east, the south, west, north. Uh, in the Indian system, they start from the east, go down south, the west, north, and the other way around. Uh, in the Western the tradition, we start from north. Huh? Then Nadir, which is right at the bottom, right? And Zenith is right onto the top when the sun is like 12 o'clock, okay? Uh, very often, the, this is the portion of the Sigala Vada Sutta that has been emphasized. Uh, but let me just go back a little bit about who is Sigala. Now, Sigala was a son of a Buddhist family living in Rajagaha. Rajagaha is a kingdom of King Bibisara, it's a capital city. And it was a prosperous city during the time of the Buddha. Even now, it has, uh, from Rajagaha, it moved to Patna, which is the capital of Bihar, state of Bihar. Now, his, Sigala's parents were both uh, very devout followers of the Buddha. But Sigala was indifferent to religion. Now, parents sometimes have that. Huh? Uh, both the husband and wife must be a very devout Buddhist and all that, but the children are not interested. <laughs> they do not want to come to talk. They do not want to come to the Vihara. They don't want to join in Dana. Uh, this, is, this is not unusual. So Sigala's parents were not able to persuade him to accompany them to visit the Buddha or even hear the teachings. Uh, the boy thought, well, that is actually hopeless. I mean, useless to pay visits to the Sangha. Because firstly, when you make visits to the Sangha, you need to give some donations. <laughs> it means some material loss. So you can find a bit stingy, right? And uh, he's more concerned about material prosperity. And he thinks spiritual progress, no use. La. <laughs> he would say to the father, well, I have nothing to do with monks. You know, I do not want to pay homage to them because my, my, my back ache yeah? and my knees become painful because I need to kneel. And uh, I had to sit on the ground and dirty my clothes. And then after getting to know them, then I'm obliged to invite them for dana, give them offerings. And uh, so I will make losses by it. So our parents also do not, do not know how to persuade him. 
But when the father was about to die, he called the son, Sigala, to his deathbed and inquired, uh, whether, is he prepared to, uh, to um, uh, have one, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, listen to one parting advice from the father? Now, of course, the father was dying and Sigala was a bit like, uh, since this is the last advice from the father, he says, of course, dear father, I will carry out whatever instructions you gave me. And the father said, well, my son, Every morning, when after you have taken your bath, could you worship the six quarters? Six quarters refers to east, uh, south, west, north, the nadir, that's right, or the bottom, and right to the top, the zenith. Uh, the Buddha, and of course, Sigala, because this is a father's dying wish, Sigala um, promised to the father that he would do so. Actually, the father asked Sigala to do this with the hope that maybe the Buddha or his disciples might see Sigala and preach to him with the appropriate advice. Uh, so Sigala remembered his father's parting wish and he said that he will carry out the instruction every morning, although he doesn't understand what the significance is. Now, at that time, the Buddha happened to be in Rajagaha. How wonderful. And you know, the Buddha has a, has a daily routine. He will rise up uh, in the morning from sleep at about 4 a.m. And uh, the Buddha sh sleeps, I think, for about two hours only. And then he will go into Nibbanic bliss, so enjoying the Nibbanic bliss and being completely like charged up. And then he spent one hour sending out his thoughts of metta, of loving kindness, pervading the whole world with loving kindness. And it is this hour of metta that he sends up for one hour. He surveys the world to find out who could benefit from his teachings that day. So that morning, Sigala came into the Buddha's uh, radar, <laughs> the Buddha's net of compassion. And with the vision, the Buddha saw that Sigala uh, could actually do better by channeling his acts of worship. So the Buddha went out for arms in Rajagaha and uh, met up with Sigala, who was worshipping the six quarters. Huh? And he gave the teachings to Sigala, known as the Sigala Vada Sutta, or Discourse to Sigala. Now, actually, this is, this is a wonderful uh, discourse. If you, don't have a, if you have not read it, it's a chance for you to read it. It covers uh, the duties of a householder. Uh, it has also been called the Vinaya of the householder. And very often when the Sigala Vada Sutta is mentioned, it talks about the diff different directions. Eh? Uh, the east direction is the relationship between parents and children. Southern direction is between teachers and pupils. The western direction is between wife, children, husband. Uh, northern direction is among friends and our associates. The Nadir, or that is directly at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Uh, is between employees and employees, and the zenith is for religious teachers and laity. So normally it's discussed in this, uh, these forms of interpretation. But besides that, the Buddha also gives some kind of advice. How do we gain a heavenly birth? Do you want to get a heavenly birth? And uh, what are the actions that needs to be, and what are the actions that we need to perform to get heavenly birth? And uh, we should eradicate uh, the vices, uh, Four vices of conduct. Uh, let me see. Okay. <laughs> Living a good lay life, gaining a heavenly birth by eradicating the four vices. If you don't steal, you don't uh, kill, you don't steal, you don't lie, you don't uh, commit adultery. This is uh, almost like our five precepts, right? So when you observe the five precepts, this is a way to gain heavenly birth. So you know now how to gain a heavenly birth. In addition, in Sagala Vada Sutta, the Buddha says that we must not act out of desire or anger or ignorance or fear. Uh, these are the four things that we should not, we should not act out. And the Buddha, <laughs> Shigala, is, uh, you know, he is always a, a, a very mischievous person going out with friends and all that. So uh, maybe they don't keep good, good company. So the Buddha gave him also this advice, how not to lose your wealth. There are six channels that we can lose our wealth, indulgence in intoxicants, hanging around in streets at um, seeming hours, I mean, hanging around and going out with all the nocturnal activities, which is not very good, eh? not good at all. 
spending too much time in entertainment, gambling, associating with evil friends, and being idle and lazy. So uh, this is a, a direct hint to Shigala that, hey, you know, <laughs> you might actually be wasting your money yeah, by doing all those things. Yeah? Then the Buddha talk about friends. Uh, so this is the part that I, I like to go through with you. Um, uh, there are what we call uh, friends uh, in the, uh, who are really enemies, all right? And then who are our true friends? Okay, so we will just go through the Sigala Vata Sutra, running through uh, the Buddha's description. Okay, there are four ways of an enemy in the guise of a friend. That means they are actually enemies, but they might appear to be friends. Uh, one is that, uh, this is how you identify them. Huh? Four, four ways you can identify the enemy. Number one, he's the one who wants to spend all your possession away. He wants to spend your money. <laughs> Number two, he offers lip service. Number three, he flatters. And number four, he wants to bring his friends to ruin. Okay, then the Buddha elaborated on each of these uh, four ways. Huh? We go to the first one. He's spending his friend's possession. He uses up and wastes his friend's wealth. Uh, you know, these are the people who get attracted to rich people or people with lots of money, especially if the parents have left them with a lot of inheritance. Uh, they know they can think of very creative ways on how to waste <laughs> the wealth of the friend, to spend the money. Yeah? And this is also the friend who do not give, who gives little, but who asks much. And this is the one who will every time f uh, follow his friends for Macan, eh? spending and then when it comes to payment time, uh, you see his hand go into the pocket, seemingly to pull out the wallet, but the wallet, you never see the color of the wallet. <laughs> you do not know how his wallet is like, oh, I pretend to pull, 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 but it doesn't come out from his pocket. So he's the one who doesn't give, he gives very little, but he wants a lot. And when he does his duty, he does his duty out of fear. And, uh, you know, when he associates with people, it's always for his advantage. It's never for his uh, friend's advantage, it's always for him, okay? So this is a very selfish uh, person who uses his friend's possession and he's only there when the friends still have money to spend. When the money is gone, they will disappear. They will not hang around people who don't have anything to spend. So they, they become like a leech and they make use of the friend's wealth, all right? So this is the first, first uh, characteristic that we need to pay attention to because they're really enemies in the guise of a friend. The second is the one who gives lip service. Ah, this is the one. Uh, as a baby, when they are born, maybe the parents put honey on the lips. <laughs> so they speak so sweetly that even the birds will come down from the branch and sit on their hand. <laughs> so they speak so well. Huh? Uh, and they say, oh, oh, okay. You know, uh, they talk about nice things. Oh, about the past, this is what we do in there to make you really happy. And then they make a lot of promise talking about the future to also lift up your heart. So, or a you know, fantastic picture about, about what to be done. And uh, just using empty words, he tries to gain your favor. Uh, but when you really need help, <laughs> he will excuse himself. Oh, I've got this appointment and that appointment, this can do, can, cannot do, you know. So, uh, so this, this actually becomes quite problematic. Huh? One who only gives lip service but who's not really sincere. The third group of people are what we call the flatterers. Yeah, this is the one again with the honey on the lips. Ah, uh, when the friend does evil deeds, ha, oh, they approve, ah, oh, what you did, very good, wah, 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 like that. And then she you also know, encourages the friend to do evil deeds. When the friend does good deeds, like making donations, going to uh, uh, you know, uh, doing something meritorious, helping people in trouble. Say, ah, yeah, why do you think like that? And they just start creating doubts in the friend's mind, you know, talking, ah, you're sure the money goes to a good thing. Ah, it might be like this, like that, you know, so raising, raising doubts. But when it comes to evil deeds, ah, oh, he actually encourages, oh, good luck, good luck. Okay. And uh, also the thing about him, the flatterers, in the presence of his friends, oh, he prays the friends, prays sky high. But behind the back of the friend, it speaks badly of the friend. Okay, so this group of people are what we call flatterers. Huh? According to the Buddha, the flatterers. So we got to be careful. So you got the flatterers, ah, you got to be careful. Huh? You do not try to uh, be, uh, be what do you call it, by persuaded by them. 
And the fourth type of friends is that he brings ruin to his friends. In what way does he bring ruin to his friends? He's a companion for drinking and drugs that causes mental confusion and heedlessness there. You hang around them, definitely. Eventually, you would also have to drink. And if they take drugs, you would also have to go take drugs. As part of the group, right? A lot of group pressure. So you would have to do that because your friends do that. So in the first place, don't keep company with them. Second is a companion for roaming the streets at night at unseemly hours. So uh, this is uh, India, but it is also true now. Uh, because in India, um, by the time we have sound down, people basically go home and have their food and they don't roam around. Roaming around at night means that uh -uh, you're really up to some uh, mischievous activities. So uh, he's a companion who wants to click, oh, come, 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 have a good time, have a good time. There are people like that. Eh? And also a companion for frequently trickle, uh, theatrical shows. This is like indulging too much on entertainment. You know? And also a companion for gambling. They're the ones who, you know, say, come, let's gamble. I encourage you to gamble. Okay. So these are the ways uh, when a person is really an enemy, but he might appear as a friend. He spends uh, your possession to spend your money away from you. He offers lip service, he flatters in order to gain favor and influence, and he brings ruin to whoever he associates with. All right. So the Buddha has given us the characteristics of friends like this so that we can make a clear distinction who really is an enemy but appears to be like a friend. And when we associate with them, we will lead. Uh, this will lead to endless trouble to us. Yeah, uh, you lose your income, lose your reputation, it leads to a downfall, including rebirth in the suffering worlds because of the performance of negative actions. Okay, on the flip side, in the Sigala Vada Sutta, the Buddha has also identified who are our true and good hearted friends and people that we can. Uh, associate with okay what are the characteristics of friends like this all right they are our helpmate they are same in happiness as well as in sorrow they offer good counsel and they are sympathetic friends all right now the buddha has given a description for each of these uh types of friends first helpmate okay what is what are the helpmates like they are warm-hearted friends that guard their friends when they are heedless. So this is when you are careless, when you are not mindful, and a good friend will actually advise you, hey, don't do that, hey, be careful. <laughs> I remember that uh, uh, for a good time when I was like uh, uh, studying overseas, I used to backpack. Uh, actually, I backpacked uh, alone in, in Europe for five weeks and jumping on trains and going by a guidebook. So I travel a good part of Europe, five weeks traveling alone. And uh, not only that, I've also traveled uh, in the United States and other places alone. The good thing about uh, alone is that you can actually uh, move around, but sometimes in your journey, you are met with uh, things to decide on. <laughs> and you don't have a person to, to check. Huh? If you have a traveling companion, uh, then you can exchange. Is it okay? Is it not? Then you get some views and then make a decision. But if you travel alone, you have to make the decision yourself. And some of the decisions are not such good decisions. Uh, but that is the thing about traveling alone. Eh? So uh, this is it. So when you have good friends with you, when the, you're careless, when somebody else play up your emotions and make you excited about buying something, then it's your friend says, I don't, I don't think this is a good buy. Just be careful. Uh -huh. So this is a friend that guards you when, uh, when you're heedless, when you're not careful. And, uh, uh, and then they also look after your property. Like for instance, uh, well, I'm also a photographer. Let me talk about photograph. Photographers, you have equipment eh, that you carry on your camera bag and just leave. Sometimes when the site is so exciting, so wonderful, you just take your camera and just run and take a picture and you forget, you leave your things behind. A friend is the one who says, ah, oh, oh, this guy has just left his camera. He just <laughs> look after the camera for you. Uh, this is a friend because he knows what is of value to you and looks, protects your wealth when you're heedless. He is also a refuge when you're in danger. A refuge is like a shelter. When you're in danger, he will actually help and support you and protect you. And when help is needed, 
he will double the amount that you need. You need some kind of uh, uh, support. He give you twice the amount that you need. Uh, so this is what you call a help me. This is the first group of friends. The second is same in happiness and sorrow. Okay. Now this is a person that actually tells you about his secrets. You know, he tells you about his secrets uh, because he has confidence with you. And if you have secrets, he listens to your secrets and he conceals your secret. He does not uh, tell your secrets around the kind of things that you have. He doesn't tell everybody. He just keeps quiet to himself. All right. And he does not forsake you when you're in fortune. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't abandon you. And when you need uh, to, um, when you are, you are in need, he's prepared to make sacrifices for you. He sacrifices for, for a friend. Wow. So this is the second group of friends who are same in happiness and same in sorrow. Okay. Now the third group of friends who offers good counsel, and these are like our advisors. Hmm? So the advisors restrain a friend from doing evil and encourages his friends to do good. More like a spiritual friend, huh? encourage us. And then certain things that you do not know, he will actually inform to you. And he also point you the way to heaven. Ah, spiritual friend. Okay. So this is a friend that, is, that offers us good counsel. And the fourth type of friend is what you call a sympathetic friend. Sometimes uh, things are not going on for you, well for you, when you have some misfortune. They do not rejoice. They will actually sympathize. They will be with you. They will hang around and support. They give you uh, the arm for you to hold on. And uh, they do not rejoice in a friend's misfortune. But when you have success, they rejoice in your success. So, <clears throat> so they have both Karuna as well as Mudita. And they restrain others speaking ill of a friend. So if somebody else was to speak badly of you, uh, they, will, they will correct that person. He says, no, 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 I don't think that's correct. Actually, the real reason was like this. So they protect their friend. And uh, when others speak well with their friends, they praise others that speak of friends. So this is what we call the sympathetic friend. So the take home message is that a good and warm hearted friend, a true friend is one who is a helpmate, a friend in happiness and woe, a friend who gives you good counsel, good advice, and also a sympathetic friend. And in fact, these are wonderful friends for us to have, and we should value and cherish such friends, like the manner that a mother would cherish her own children. So please look after your friends, remember your friends, especially during festive season, don't forget them. Keep, keep in touch. Uh, and then uh, sometimes, sometimes when we work in a Buddhist community, uh, our relationship is so business-like, uh, just to get things done, just to get projects off the ground. And we might have meetings like a week, uh, uh, like monthly meeting or meeting once every two months or whatever that are based on the regularity of your meeting. Uh, it's just getting things uh, done uh, in order to be effective. And sometimes we don't have much time to touch base and find out about our friends, how they're doing. And sometimes it's quite good, you know, to, to find out how they're doing, what are the challenges they're faced and all that. Yeah? So this is something that we should do. Now, let, us, let me move, move on. Uh, so after talking about spiritual friends and the characteristic of friends, how do we develop love and friendship? And the secret of this lies in the practice of loving kindness and of metta. As the Buddha mentioned about the importance of practicing loving kindness and metta. And the Buddha himself practiced metta for one hour, radiating to the world, seeing who might be actually able to benefit from his loving kindness. Yeah. All right. This is what I've just mentioned. The practice of metta is to develop a loving heart. A metta actually comes from the word friend. Mitta, all right? So it is a practice of friendliness, practice of universal friendliness to each and everyone, to all beings uh, without exception. And what is metta? It is a loving kindness. It is bound, it's a boundless love for all beings without discrimination. Uh, just like ourselves, we like to be happy. We like to be healthy and safe. In the same manner, we have the same wish to all other sentient beings. And this kind of wish of loving kindness transcends all barriers such as race, color, caste, 
as well as creek. There's no barriers. Huh? It's, a, it's a living kindness that spread towards all. Now, the best analogy that was given in the Karanya Metta Sutta, uh, or the discourse on loving kindness from the verse 7, is just like a mother would protect her only child at the risk of a life. Even so, we must practice a boundless heart towards all beings. Okay, so this is the advice given by the Buddha on the practice of loving kindness. Loving kindness trains us to touch everyone with love and kindness. But even so, please don't forget yourself <laughs> when you think about, uh, okay, uh, when you treat people that you love and respect, how do you treat them? You're kind, you're patient to them. When they have made a mistake, you forgive them and you give them space. You give them time and opportunity, uh, opportunity room to grow. Now, think about how you treat yourself. Do you treat your, yourself like the way you treat your, your best and respected friends? And if you don't, why not? Because you should treat yourself the same way too. Because loving kindness is not just a reason for others, it is also a reason for yourself. Sometimes people are tend to be too, too uh, critical about themselves. And that becomes a problem. Uh, because you can't really be happy when you keep on criticizing yourself, finding faults in yourself, right? So you need to treat yourself or like a respected a friend. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you need also to be patient with yourself and you give yourself some space to grow. So loving kindness, the first part of loving kindness is uh, to radiate loving kindness to yourself, meta to yourself, and then you radiate loving kindness to others. All right. Uh, some of the things that you can show loving kindness to yourself is that uh, do you show love to your own mind and body? Do you sleep properly? Do you have enough sleep? Do you eat healthily? Uh, do you have do you give time and space to understand your own spirituality? Do you exercise and avoid toxic influences? Yeah, toxic influences could be, come from many sources. One could be the physical toxic influences. The other one sometimes taking in too much uh, negative uh, com uh, speech or news could actually be toxic. And also uh, reflecting and meditating. So this is how you look after yourself. Make sure that you sleep well, you eat well and healthily. Don't overeat. Also give your time space. Give yourself time and space for you to look after your own spirituality. Make sure that you also advise uh, exercise because uh, one of the things that someone sent to me was that uh, as you get more senior, there is uh, the worry about going into dementia. So it was found that if you do walking exercises on a, almost a daily basis, this is a way uh, to, uh, to ward off uh, dementia. But of course, exercise does many things. Huh? It's looking after your body and, and mind. Um, I will go for my morning walk, if not morning, then the evening walk. And sometimes when I do my walking, I do a little bit of like, uh, well, we could say a little chant uh, so that the mind don't get distracted looking at the whole, looking around. The mind is actually, uh, but you're still aware of what's happening, but the mind goes through a kind of a list of various types of quality that has to do with the Dhamma. <laughs> so it's almost like a kind of meditation. So you keep your mind on target while you go through this physical exercise. And I think this is really wonderful, something that we should do. And also give yourself some time to reflect and meditate, right? And of course, what I can recommend to you is to practice loving kindness meditation as a way of how you look after yourself, a way of loving yourself. And as Brother Bobby mentioned right at the start, I've been leading a meta meditation for many years now. And now I have actually gone online. so. Online means regardless of where you are, whether you're actually in PJ or in KL or in any part of the country or any part of the world, you can, you can actually join uh, on a Wednesday night and, and at uh, 9 p.m. Malaysian time. You can actually participate in this loving kindness meditation that I lead. Uh, actually, I'm very happy to say that once since we have gone online, we've got practitioners coming from different parts of the world. You might be surprised that there are some people from the other part of the world from the United States joining our Meta Meditation. So while we practice here at 9, 9 p.m., they will actually be practicing loving kindness at 9 a.m. 
<laughs> 9 a.m., 10 a.m., or 8 a.m., depending which which time zone they are in the United States. Sometimes we have people in Canada, in the UK, in Australia, sometimes also in Bhutan, in India, in Bangladesh, and in UAE, <laughs> in Australia, <laughs> uh, Thailand, Cambodia. So we have people from different parts at, coming and joining us on a, uh, a regular basis uh, that we have on on a weekly basis. This, this is a way of how you keep in touch. But besides this weekly meditation, you can also practice metta, uh, you know, on uh, something more regular than that. This, that'd be really wonderful. Now, um, uh, we want to do a little exercise that is developing empathy. And this exercise is called Just Like Me. Now, what is, what is empathy? Empathy, uh, uh, when we begin to uh, uh, perceive uh, the similarity between ourselves and others, all right? It is like uh, putting yourself in somebody else's shoe. That is me. That is the meaning of being empathetic. Huh? The more we perceive that someone is more like us, the more sympathetic we are to them. So in order to develop good friendship, we also need to have empathy and sympathy. Sometimes we do not want sympathy. We just want empathy. Empathy means a person really understands our situation. So that is what we mean by empathy. Yeah? So uh, we're going to just have a little exercise on the development of empathy yeah? uh, by looking at um, just like me. Um, so uh, we will do a little reflection. Are you ready to do a little exercise? OK, so sit in a comfortable position. You might like to close your eyes right now. Can you think of a person or any person like a friend uh, and visualize this person so that his image comes to your mind. Can you please do this? Just sit back in a comfortable position and visualize your mind, in your mind, a person who is like a friend. And keep this person's mind, yeah, image in your mind. Can you just reflect that this person in my mind it's just like me. This person, he has a body and he has a mind just like me. Just like me, he has a body and his body is subject to the forces of nature. His body, just like my body, will get sick, will grow old, and one day will have to pass away. He needs food to eat, water to drink, and the air to breathe just like me. He or she has feelings and emotions and thoughts just like me. Just like me. He or she has a share of happiness and disappointment, success, as well as failures. Sometimes he is angry and confused and have acted rather foolishly, like the way I would do sometimes. And at other times, he will act with kindness and he sacrifices for others, just like me. Just like me, he wants to experience happiness and to be free from pain. Just like me, he wishes to be healthy. He wants to be valued and he wants to be loved. He also wants to have happiness for his family 
you also have happiness in this workplace as well as relationship. He wishes, wishes to be happy, just like me, just like me. He just wants to be happy. So I would wish him good health and happiness because he's a fellow human being, just like me. All right, so you can slowly open your eyes. Uh, so that is an exercise that we do on developing empathy. When you begin to think, hey, this person is just like me. He goes through the same thing just like me. Yeah. All right. So um, that is just based on our reflection. Uh, now we just, we, we're just going to do a little experiment. So I want you to think of someone, yeah? maybe a friend someone that you know it could be a cousin a friend uh, somebody quite close to you or if you don't have you can't think of anything maybe think of a pet if you like a, you have a kitten you got a little puppy <laughs> just think of uh, a pet also okay all right can you just now think of think of that that person now you can close your eyes and just send your loving thoughts to that person or to your pet, you may say, may you be happy, yeah? sending your love to your person or to your pet, having this wish of happiness for that person, may you be happy. See the wish is a sincerity from your heart with a smile in your heart, making a wish, may you be happy. All right, you can open up your eyes. How do you feel when you make a wish? To your friend or even to your pet when you wish happiness to the other person how do you feel i am not able to get your feedback right now but i'm sure uh, amongst the many of you uh, many of you would have felt happy right you have the sense of happiness by wishing somebody happiness you get happiness yourself uh, there are some uh, reasons why this is actually so so the thing is, if you were to practice loving kindness, meditation, you yourself will also be filled with this happiness that you send to others and the happiness of loving kindness matter. All right, now we just have a few minutes. We will do a quick run through of loving kindness, sending loving kindness to a friend. And the steps that we will do is number one, we bring a smile to your body. And then we send loving kindness to yourself and then loving kindness to others. In this case, we will send loving kindness to a friend. Uh, think of a friend because we're going to send loving kindness to your, to your friend. It could be a he or a she, doesn't matter, a friend, okay? So these are the steps. Uh, the first is body awareness that we will just do scanning of the body and we'll be aware of the sensations. We'll do this very quickly, run through the body. This is a very good exercise because if you can feel the sensations of your body, that means you're here right now in the present moment. If you can feel the sensations of your body. So we will create, uh, heighten the sense of awareness of the present moment by scanning your body, yeah? Being aware though. Then we bring loving kindness uh, to your body, uh, bringing a smile to different parts of the body. And then uh, there is this word of kindfulness that was coined by Arjun Brown. It is the combination between kindness and mindfulness. So kindfulness. So you use kindfulness, the kindness and the mindfulness. The kindness and the awareness and mindfulness together. Yeah? So second step is that you send uh, love and kindness to yourself, making the wish that may my heart be peaceful and free. And you, we smile as we say this. 
And then third is that we make this wish to the person, to your friend, and say, may your heart be peaceful and free. And smile as you see this. All right. Uh, so are we uh, ready? Uh, I think it is better if I have a bell. Okay, just hold on. Sorry, just 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 when people begin to think that maybe at the back of me is a virtual background now, you know that it is a room. <laughs> okay, so are you ready? We will do a little bit of a meta meditation. All right, I will just sing the bell and you close your eyes and uh, we will just do a few minutes of loving kindness meditation. Close your eyes. And take a few deep breath. And as you do so, just relax yourself. Just relax yourself as you take a few deep breaths. Now, can you just be aware of your, the top of your head, your crown area, the top of your head, your scalp. Can you feel some sensations there? Sensations on the top of your head. Bring a smile to your crown area. Let your crown area smile. Now just be aware of your forehead. Can you feel some sensations on your forehead? What are the sensations that you feel right now? On your forehead. Bring a smile to your forehead. Now just be aware of your eyes. Can you feel your eyes? Can you bring a smile to your eyes? Now, can you feel your cheeks? Can you feel the sensation of your cheeks? Very good. Now, uh, bring a smile to your cheeks. Be aware of your throat. Feel the sensations in your throat. Bring a smile in your throat. All right, now let's go into the body itself, touching the major organs of our body and bringing smiles to the organs so that they remain healthy and strong and uh, bring you good health and happiness. Huh? So your heart, be aware of your heart region. Putting a smile to your heart. Let your heart smile. And touching the other organs in your body, your liver, bringing a smile to your liver. Your liver is just below your right ribs. Huh? That's where your liver is. Bring a smile to your liver. And your pancreas and spleen. And your kidneys and all the other organs in your body. Including your digestive system, your stomach and intestines. Bring a smile. 
Bring a smile down to the lower part of your body, down your legs, right down to the sole of your feet. And also not forgetting your arms, your palms. So your entire body is smiling right now. Now let us send loving kindness first to ourselves. Say, may my heart be peaceful and free. May my heart be peaceful and free. Have a sense of happiness and joy. May my heart be peaceful and free. Just make that wish. Smiling inside. You are enjoying the bliss of happiness, of well-being, of good health. And these are all blessings. May I, may my mind, may my heart be peaceful and free. And now, uh, just think of your friend, the friend that you have chosen right now. Have a picture of your friend so that he or she appears very vivid in your mind. And you make the sincere wish, you say, may your heart be peaceful and free, my friend. May your heart be peaceful and free. Smile in your heart as you make this wish to your friend. You just have the empathy. Think, ah, you're also just like me. You are just like me. My friend, may your heart be peaceful and free. So, all right, so that is a little practice on loving kindness meditation, but uh, loving kindness and sending it to a friend. That is how we go about developing our love and our friendliness yeah? to open up the heart, uh, to be more empathetic and to be more loving. Uh, also, remember to send loving kindness to yourself so that you uh, neutralize and balance your mind. Uh, loving kindness is a wonderful way of neutralizing and balancing the mind. You know, sometimes the mind can be uh, unbalanced. Yeah. And uh, when you do loving kindness, it helps to reset the mind, to focus the mind. So if the mind has, uh, has uh, got negative tendencies, uh, that's how you neutralize it. So as you could experience uh, from a very little uh, practice of meta meditation, that when you begin to have love, and uh, loving kindness in your heart. There is no anger, there's no hatred, there's no dissatisfaction, jealousy or envy. All these negative uh, qualities are absent from the mind and heart. When metta is there, all these other negative qualities will disappear. So it is really an antidote. And as you begin to cultivate loving kindness more and more, there, there will be less anger, less hatred, less dissatisfaction, less jealousy, and less envy. <laughs> then these negative qualities will subside as a, 
as they are being replaced by the positive quality generated by loving kindness meditation. And metta is certainly a very fertile ground for us to cultivate other spiritual qualities. So when there's metta, when there's compassion in the heart, other spiritual qualities will blossom. Because when the heart is immersed in hatred and vengeance, there is no spiritual quality that can develop uh, with such a mind. So in order to have a fertile ground for spiritual qualities to spring from, we need to cultivate it. We need to put the, the uh, fertilizer of, of loving kindness. And uh, so loving kindness, metta, is the way that we develop love and friendship. Okay, so that is uh, the su substance of my talk. And I hope that, um, uh, that uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for, for question and answer uh, because we're going to have a lion dance uh, after this. So uh, please come and join, join, join us in our, our cyberspace uh, meta meditation held every Wednesday and Wednesday night at 9 p.m. It is online. You can join us on BJF Facebook Live. All right. And join the community of meditators coming from uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and uh, in different parts of the world doing meta together. All right. So with that, I'd like to wish you good health and peace. And may this uh, be a really good and happy year for you, making good progress in all the different directions. All right. So now back to you, Brother Bobby. Thank you, Dr. Sri, for sharing on meta and also the practice, the practical acts. Do join us on Wednesday nights at 8, 9 p.m. for Dr. Sri's uh, weekly meta session.